This is a News 4 special presentation, Decision 2021, The Race for Virginia Governor, a forum for the Democratic candidates, former Delegate Jennifer Carroll Foy, Delegate Lee Carter, Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax, former Governor Terry McAuliffe, and State Senator Jennifer McClellan, facing off before the June 8th primary. Now, from the Meet the Press studios in Washington, here's NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd. Hello there, I'm Chuck Todd and welcome to the Virginia Democratic Governor Candidates Forum, made possible by the Democratic Party of Virginia, NBC4, and Telemundo 44. This forum is airing on NBC stations across the state of Virginia and streaming in the NBC Washington app and Roku and on Apple TV. This governor's race comes at a pivotal moment for the Commonwealth and the nation. The winner of the Democratic primary on June 8th will face Republican nominee Glenn Youngkin. In the next hour, we're going to hear where these five candidates stand on critical issues that impact the health, safety, and future of all Virginians. We're going to begin by quickly covering the rules of today's event. The debate will last one hour and we'll begin with one minute opening statements from each candidate. Then our panelists and myself will pose questions directly to the candidates. I should note these questions are determined by NBC News and the panelists. They have not been reviewed by the candidates nor the Democratic Party of Virginia or anyone else. Each candidate will have one minute to respond and as moderator I will reserve the right to follow up or allow rebuttals as needed. The candidates will have a visual notification of their remaining time and when time has expired. We ask the candidates to please adhere to these time limits. There are a lot of you on this stage. Now let's welcome our panelists. News 4 Today anchor Jumi Olabanji, News 4 Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Julie Carey, and Telemundo 44 reporter Alberto Pimienta. All of them join us from NBC4 studios in Washington. And here are the candidates joining us from separate locations. It's Virginia Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax, former Governor Terry McAuliffe, State Delegate Lee Carter, former State Delegate Jennifer Carroll Foy, and State Senator Jennifer McClellan. The order of opening statements was determined in a drawing by the candidates. Mr. Fairfax, you are up first. You have one minute. Thank you so much, uh, Chuck, and thank you to uh, all of our great viewers. As you mentioned, this is a pivotal moment in the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and now is the time uh, to have a vision that is focused on lifting up all eight and a half million Virginians, uh, something that I've been proud to do over the last nearly four years as Lieutenant Governor. Uh, my proudest day was when I was able to break the ties to expand Medicaid here in Virginia, and today more than 550,000 more Virginians have health insurance as a result of the work that we've all done together. Uh, we've also done record uh, and historic work on criminal justice reform. Uh, I've led the way on creating more housing security here in the Commonwealth. And as we come through this COVID-19 pandemic, we understand uh, that there are so many issues of inequality uh, and injustice that we have to face uh, right now in our Commonwealth that also uh, exist around our nation. And so we have put forward the most ambitious plan around education investment, and we look forward uh, to making sure that all Virginians get to rise and thrive uh, coming out of this very difficult period. Thank you, Mr. Fairfax. Mr. McAuliffe, your one minute opening statement. Virginia has made great progress over the course of the last eight years, record investments in education, building the new Virginia economy, health care. That's all at risk today. The Republicans have just nominated an extreme right wing billionaire to be their nominee. And he has pledged to spend $75 million of his own money. And what did this billionaire do right before his nomination? He campaigned all over Virginia with Senator Ted Cruz. Who was his first endorsement after he was nominated? Donald J. Trump. In the first rally he gave after his nomination, he came out to eliminate abortion in Virginia and to put more guns on the street. We've lived through an experiment at the White House with a right-wing billionaire. We've seen the damage that has been done to our country. We cannot let Glenn Youngkin do to Virginia what Donald Trump did to our country. I'm running for governor on a big, bold plan to take Virginia to the next level, to lead this country out of the COVID crisis. It's time to go big, no more tinkering around the edges. Thank you, Mr. McAuliffe. Mr. Carter, your opening statement. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Lee Carter. I'm proud to have represented the people of the 50th district, that's Manassas and Western Prince William County. 
for the last four years, and I don't come from a normal background for a politician. I'm not a millionaire. I'm not an attorney. I'm an enlisted Marine Corps veteran and an electronics repairman. And I got involved in Virginia politics after I got hurt at work. And I've been fighting tirelessly since day one to make life better for the working people of this Commonwealth, both in and out of the workplace. And we are in a pivotal moment in the history of this Commonwealth, one where we have to decide whether we will return to the status quo, the way things were before COVID-19, where hundreds of thousands of Virginians could not afford to keep a roof over their head and could not afford the health care that their families needed, or if we will transform this Commonwealth into a place where wealth is common, where everyone can live and work and not have to worry about how they're going to put food on the table or make the rent, or whether or not they can afford a doctor or to put their kids through college, or whether they're going to be discriminated against based on who they are, who they were, the love, or who they were born to be. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Uh, Ms. Carol, uh, Ms. Carol Foy, you're next. I was born and raised in Petersburg, Virginia. Petersburg is a strong community thanks to the people I grew up with, our faith leaders, my teacher, Sergeant Major Frost, and my grandmother, Mary Lee. People in our community fought to keep Petersburg alive when politicians of the past turned their backs on us. That's why I became a foster mom a Virginia Military Institute graduate, a public defender, and a legislator who passed bills and budgets to uplift working families and to fight for our communities. And I'm proud to say I was one of the most effective legislators in the House of Delegates, expanding Medicaid to over 500,000 Virginians and leading the fight to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. And as your next governor, I will bring diverse, high-paying jobs to every corner of the Commonwealth, stand with families impacted by police violence, and increase funding for education and teachers. Look, Republicans are hoping we recycle the same old policies and politicians of the past. That's why we need to nominate a new leader with a clear vision and bold ideas to move Virginia forward. Thank you, uh, Ms. Carol Foy. And finally, uh, Ms. McClellan, your opening statement. Thank you, Chuck. I believe in the power of state government and the Democratic Party to affect change that solves people's problems and improves their lives. That's exactly what we need right now. As we navigate our recovery, we need to health care. And that's the kind of we need. we need a candidate who will meet Glenn Youngman and show that Virginians are ready for someone who will not just look to divide us, but bring us together, lead us out of the critical crisis we are in, to make Virginia a stronger, more united, and more equitable commonwealth. I thank you all. Thank you for being here. Let's the questions later in this debate. We're going to discuss the economy, health care, and education. But I do want to start on the top of that. More than 3 million Virginians have been vaccinated against the coronavirus, 40% of the population, 4 0. As governor, how do you encourage Virginians to act, especially with the new CDC, that indicates vaccinated Americans don't need to wear masks, but you don't have to be vaccinated yet? Should businesses and Commonwealth have proof of receiving the vaccine to attend sports and concerts like that as a more shots in the arms. Uh, with the order of this question, uh, Mr. McAuliffe, we'd like you to answer first. One minute. Well, sure. And I think businesses should require to see vaccination cards. Our goal should be to have every individual in America, specifically here, we want them in Virginia, for everybody uh, to get the vaccination. We got to make sure that everybody is safe. And that is the key goal for all of us. As we move forward, I think the state and the federal, and I mean, first of all, I do want to uh really give congratulations to President Biden for the great work that he has done. We know what we lived through under Donald Trump for four years. We know what he did and didn't do on the vaccinations, pretending it didn't even exist. And if you somehow drink Clorox, it'll go away, this horrible COVID-19. I want to give uh, special congratulations to President Biden and Governor Northam for the great job we've done here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. But we need everybody vaccinated. Yesterday was Vaccinate Virginia Day. 
now that those older over the age of 12, they can now get their uh, one vaccination, any one of the three they can get. So let's go ahead. Let's get everybody vaccinated. And I'm all for businesses. If you want to come into my business establishment, I want to see a vaccination because I want to keep my customers safe. Absolutely. Mr. Carter, same question to you. How would you increase vaccinations? Well, I think we need to lead by example. So uh, I'm happy to say that I got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, I am a parent to uh, four kids, one of which is less than three months old. Uh, and so, you know, being able to go out there and get it done, get it, you know, one and done, not have to make multiple appointments, that was incredibly important to me and to my family. Uh, but I want to encourage people not to let off the gas. I think that the CDC guidelines saying that, uh, you know, we, we don't have to wear masks if we're vaccinated. But as you said, Chuck, we don't know who's vaccinated and who's not. Uh, I think that was premature. Um, and I think that, frankly, a lot of people are going to try to take advantage of that ambiguity, that fact that nobody knows uh, who's vaccinated and who's not to try to not wear a mask. But when you do that, when you're not vaccinated and you're not wearing a mask, you're putting people in jeopardy that can't take the vaccine. So all four of my kids, they range from uh, two and a half months to 11 years old. None of them are eligible for the vaccine. I mean, a compromised people that can't take the vaccine, people that have uh, allergies to it. So please do your part to make sure everyone is safe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carter. Uh, Ms. Carol Foy, uh, your answer to this question, how would you increase the vaccination rate? So millions of families are trying to figure out how to keep their families safe, how to help their children learn while still trying to pay the bills. And as the next governor here in Virginia, I will get shots and arms and people in jobs. I can tell you that I will ensure that there's equitable distribution of the vaccines where you see some rural communities and predominantly African-American, Latinx and AAPI community that have not been able to attain uh, the vaccine in an equitable fashion. So I will address that and go directly to those communities, investing in mobile health clinics to meet people where they are so transportation is not a barrier. Also, we want to ensure that, you know, make that people who don't speak English as a predominant language, that we have the information in everyone's native tongue. And so therefore, more people will have access and know where to get it, why it's important. And that's what we need to do, have the information be more accessible. And I will work with our faith leaders because that's how we uh, effectively and efficiently can distribute information to the people who need it the most. So these are the things that I will do as governor to keep everyone safe. Thank you, uh, Ms. Carol Foy. Ms. McClellan, uh, how would you up the vaccination rate? We have to work with our uh, trusted community leaders and have more vaccine clinics in our communities, smaller uh, clinics in areas that people are used to going to that are easy to get to, uh, have, making sure that we have information that is easy to understand in multiple languages, uh, making sure that we are um, removing barriers to access uh, including the mobile clinics in the rural areas, which have been continuing, uh, but making sure we are meeting people where they are. Our first priority as government is to keep people safe. And if we see that the numbers start going up, uh, that the vaccine vaccination rates are going down, the cases are going up, we are going to have to adjust. And we saw with this crisis that our uh, health departments were not mobile and nimble enough to adjust uh, immediately. We've got to address that. And we've got to make sure that people can, uh, if they have to have a appointment, there are multiple ways they can make that appointment, not just going through a computer system that may not work. Uh, we've got to be nimble and meet people where they are. Ms. McClellan, thank you. And Mr. Fairfax, um, your answer to figuring out how do we increase the vaccination rate? Well, we have, uh, Chuck, come a very long way uh, and have made tremendous progress. Virginia now has the seventh lowest rate of new infections here in the nation. Uh, and we have the lowest number of people uh, admitted to the hospital uh, at any point during this pandemic. And so uh, we need to recognize uh, the work that we've done, but we need to continue uh, to press forward to ensure uh, that we are reaching every part and every community here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, our critical partnerships uh, in minority communities must continue. We must make the vaccine available uh, on demand uh, to the extent possible. Uh, and also uh, working with the private sector, uh, our pharmacy partners and uh, supermarkets and others where people have uh, daily points of contact have been invaluable in terms of ensuring that people have more uh, and equitable access to the vaccine. Uh, I also believe that private businesses uh, and the government uh, should uh, require those vaccinations and 
uh, and also encourage people to continue uh, to wear masks and following CDC guidance, but also understanding that we're not out of the woods yet. Thank you, Mr. Fairfax. Jumi Olabanji has the next question. Chuck, thank you so much. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about education now. We know nearly all schools across Virginia are now open. Students are back in the classroom at least a few days a week. Uh, but virtual learning really took a toll on so many students across the state. In Fairfax County, for example, the percentage of students in middle and high school who earned F grades in at least two classes jumped by 83% in the first quarter. So my question is, what needs to be done this summer and next fall to help those students catch up? And please be specific in your answer. Uh, we will start this time with Mr. Carter. I think that we need to directly tackle the inequities that exist in our education funding. Uh, you know, we have some localities where parents choose between the best public schools that any locality uh, can offer or choice private schools. And we have other localities where there is no option at all. And all you get is a, a building that is crumbling down around the students. So the, the Commonwealth has to step up. Uh, we have to massively increase the state share of funding uh, for our K-12 schools, and we have to do that immediately. And beyond that, we have to make sure that those increases in the state share of funding are not limited to one governor's term. You know, if it's just a line item in the budget, that can be undone by the next governor. So we need to make sure that we're amending Virginia's constitution uh, to, to provide a real guarantee uh, that every student shall receive uh, an equal high quality education as a constitutional mandate that can be enforced by the courts. We currently don't have that and we need it. All right, Mr. Carter, thank you. Ms. Carol Foy, if you could answer next. Absolutely. So I can tell you that as a former elementary substitute teacher, I know that our teachers are overworked and underpaid. And that is exactly why I had a roundtable on education, bringing faculty, staff, administrators, teachers, and parents to the table to address some of our top issues here in Virginia in regards to education. And here's what I heard. You know, we need to address the deficit in learning and the loss of learning that many of our students have. Not only that, you know, many of our kids have been sheltered in place with their abusers. So there's going to be mental health consequences as well. So as governor, what I will do is ensure that we have an extra quarter of school over the summer where our children can, you know, go to school and actually be assessed on what is missing in their learning skill set and have it addressed. I will put millions of dollars towards teacher aides in the classroom. I will also fund a Department of Education's recommendation of having one school counselor to every 250 students so we can address our children's mental health as well. All right, Ms. Carol Foy, thank you so much. Ms. McClellan, if you could answer next. Yes, as a parent of a kindergartner and a fifth grader in Richmond Public Schools, I have seen that the inequities that were already in our system have been made worse and now are, are between households, not just zip codes. Uh, at a bare minimum, we need to uh, rec fully implement the Board of Education's recommended standards of quality, which is what they say all of our schools need to provide a high quality education to each child. I've been working with Delegate LaCherise Ayer to do that. Uh, that is the basis of another candidate's bold plan, but it's frankly not bold, it's old. We need to go farther and make sure that we are not only assessing where the kids are now, providing specific uh, instruction to get there where they need to be, give our localities more flexibility if they need to have year-round school or longer days. Uh, we need to make sure we are lifting the cap on support personnel so the mental health professionals, nurses, social workers are back in the building to address the need, the wraparound services needs of our children. And we need to address the crumbling schools by having the state fund again construction and renovation. Ms. McClellan, thank you. Mr. Fairfax, if you could answer next. Yes, uh, and the learning loss that we've seen throughout this COVID-19 pandemic is something that must be immediately addressed, but it also uh, harkens to uh, much of the inequality that has, ex that has existed in our public school system uh, for years uh, and generations. Uh, and so I proposed uh, the most transformational intergenerational investment in K-12 public schools in the history of Virginia uh, called a 40-30-10 plan. We would rebuild and reimagine every public school that's at least 40 years old with a $30 billion investment and to do so within 10 years. Uh, as part of that, we would raise teacher pay above the national average for the first time in the history of Virginia uh, and also guarantee a summer enrichment 
uh, opportunity for every young person in Virginia from here going forward. And this would allow our young in the arts, the athletics, uh, and in other fields so that they can uh, year round have the opportunity to continue to advance their educational pursuits. And I think this is going to be transformational for all of Virginia. Okay, Mr. Fairfax, thank you for that answer. And finally, Mr. McCullough, if you could answer. Clearly with COVID, uh, our children have lost over a year of learning. So we've got to look at summer school, remedial work, but I announced my campaign about education. We need to go big and bold here in Virginia. No more tinkering around the edges. I call for a $2 billion a year investment in education. If you take average teacher pay and compare it to the average pay of Virginians, Virginia ranks 50th out of 50 states. We're dead last. That's a disgrace. And you wonder why we're down 1,100 teachers. Teachers can go to Maryland or Pennsylvania or Delaware today and get 10 to $20,000 more a teacher. So let's raise our teacher pay above the national average for the first time ever. I also call for the 40,000 at-risk three and four-year-olds to get them pre-K here in the Commonwealth. I also promise you within two years of being governor, I will make sure that every child in Virginia has access to broadband. We need connectivity. How unfair during COVID, children don't have connectivity, so they gotta go to McDonald's to a Wi-Fi hotspot. I will get everybody Wi-Fi. And I will also diversify our educator base. I did this before. I put a billion dollars in the last time I was governor, even though I inherited a record deficit. I did it before, I'll do it again. It's time to go big on education. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Julie Carey has the next question. And I want to turn to health care now. The pandemic has put a spotlight on the issue of paid sick leave, and many Democrats have campaigned on a promise to deliver it. Yet last session, the General Assembly approved a scaled-down plan that's only for home health care workers. How great a priority would you make paid sick leave for all workers in 2022? And where would you draw the line on which businesses must provide the benefit? Those with more than five employees, more than 15, 25 plus, or even bigger? Ms. Carol Foy, we begin with you. So I can tell you that I believe that healthcare is a right and not a privilege. And I had to, at a young age, make the difficult decision after my grandmother who raised me had a stroke and became a quadriplegic about whether or not we were going to pay for our mortgage to keep a roof over our heads or for the medications keeping my grandmother alive. So I understand instantly the importance of healthcare. And that's why I helped champion paid sick days here in Virginia, but I also carried the legislation to have paid family medical leave. And I would not stop there. I will invest in the reinsurance program to drive down the costs of health care, making it more affordable for more people. I will have a prescription drug affordability board that negotiates the cost of health of prescription pills and health care here in Virginia, saving Virginians millions of dollars and us as a state as well. So that's what it's about. It's also about reducing the black maternal mortality rate, which I have championed a bill to help pass, and I will protect uh, Roe versus Wade by enshrining it into our Constitution. Ms. McClellan, you're next. We have seen with COVID how too many families and too many workers have had to choose between their own health and paying their bills, uh, even those who work for small businesses. And that's why we need to have a paid sick days and paid family medical leave for all employees. But we've got to work with our small businesses to make sure they can do that, which is why this session, I was proud to work to create the Community uh, Development Fund to help our SWAM businesses to meet some of these challenges by using low interest loans that can be forgivable under certain circumstances that can be used to help provide uh, paid sick days and to create a insurance program uh, for paid family medical leave so that all all workers and all employers can provide it because our small businesses want to do it. They can't compete with the bigger, bigger companies that can provide paid family medical leave or paid sick leave. We've got to help them do it so that no one has to choose between eating and paying their bills or, or caring for themselves or a family member when they are sick, especially if they put someone else at risk. Mr. Fairfax. We have got to ensure that families are able to get back to work safely, uh, that their wages are raised, and that they have the ability uh, to take care of family members uh, in the time, uh, not just of the COVID-19 crisis, but uh, in everyday life. And so we need to ensure there is paid uh, family leave and paid sick leave. Uh, you asked about the uh, level at which that's done. I think to be responsive to the needs of small businesses, we need to look 
uh, at 25 or more employees and also provide uh, subsidies uh, at state level uh, in the form of tax credits and grants and no and low interest loans uh, to ensure that those small businesses can afford uh, to provide uh, that critical leave, uh, both to get their employees back to work, uh, but also to get our economy jump started. Uh, we in Virginia have, have had a very strong recovery uh, throughout this COVID-19 pandemic. We went from having two and a half percent unemployment uh, right before the beginning uh, of this COVID-19 pandemic to up to 11.3 percent now today, closer to five percent. This is a critical component of restarting our economy and keeping our families safe. Mr. McAuliffe, your answer. Well, it's a great question, Julie, because 41 percent of Virginians in the private sector do not have any paid sick day. So here we are during a crisis. People get sick. But for many Virginians, they can't afford not to go to work. So do we really want sick people actually going in and infecting their co-workers? Of course not. So I've long argued we need to have paid sick pay. We need to have paid hazard pay. And we need family medical leave. It's ad critical what we need to do here in the Commonwealth of Virginia on health care. We still have 700,000 Virginians without access to health care, including 100,000 children. So as governor, what I'll do, the first thing is I'll call my good friend, President Joe Biden. I'll get us a Section 1332 waiver here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, which will allow us to stand up our own reinsurance program, stand up our own state exchange, invest and make sure we're doing more on telehealth. And I will go after the prescription drug companies. The sunlight law I will put in place will see these prescription drug prices. But let's be clear, Glenn Youngkin, the Republican nominee, opposed Medicaid expansion. He was against it. He said it was wrong. And for 500,000 Virginians who got health care because of Medicaid expansion, Glenn Youngkin is against it. And Mr. Carter. Well, every Virginia worker needs paid sick leave. I would not draw the line anywhere. I think uh, if you are working, then paid sick leave should be a part of your compensation package. But beyond that, we have a health care system that is absolutely unconscionable. And COVID-19 really drew out uh, the, the biggest weakness in it, which is that during a pandemic, when we needed the most people to have health insurance that we could possibly get, hundreds of thousands of Virginians lost their health insurance because they lost their jobs. So I don't think that health insurance should be tied to employment at all. The other four candidates here are all talking about changes they will make while keeping the existing system in place. I am fighting for a universal health care system that will guarantee not just access, not just affordability, but real guaranteed health care for everyone who needs it. So that when you need to see a doctor, you can go see a doctor regardless of how much is in your wallet or what your job is or whether or not your employer approves. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carter. For the next question, Alberto Pimienta has it. We're going to talk about the economy now. According to a report by Old Dominion University, the COVID-19 pand pandemic wiped out nearly a decade of job gains in Virginia. About half of those jobs have been restored. But what else can you do in order to fully reignite the economy here in the state? We're going to begin with Ms. McClellan. So this is difficult to answer in just 60 seconds. My full economic recovery plan can be seen on my website at jennifermcclellan.com. But in the short version is we've got to recognize that this uh, crisis was not one size fits all. Our approach cannot be one size fits all. We've got to recognize that our brick and mortar retail, restaurants, hospitality, tourism, people facing businesses, some of which were already struggling before COVID are the ones that need the most help getting back on their feet. Uh, and we need to make sure that those workers have the resources that they need, including childcare, which is why the first plan I announced was a universal childcare plan, because our workers cannot get back to work if they have nowhere for their children to go. And making sure that they have uh, access to uh, PPE and uh, any health needs that they have met so that they can work as well. We've got to unshackle, uh, continue to let grow solar and uh, energy, clean energy jobs that were put in place uh, with the Clean Economy Act, which I passed, making sure that they are being implemented correctly. Uh, but go to my website for the full plan. Thank you, Mr. Fairfax, your turn. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Virginia has had a strong economic uh, recovery coming out of COVID-19 relative to other states, but there's so much more that we can and should do. Uh, we need to in continue to increase wages uh, to make sure that people who are returning to work can do so. I provide for their families. We've raised the minimum wage here in Virginia 
uh, after uh, more than a decade uh, of its being stagnant at 725, it's now at 950. I think we should get to $15 an hour uh, and can do so within the next several years. Uh, we also uh, have to make sure that businesses and particularly small and medium sized businesses uh, have the access to capital so that those that close can restart uh, and those that have continued to operate uh, can have what they need uh, to get through this period. And so we know at the federal level, the PPP program was instrumental uh, in allowing people to survive and thrive. I think at the state level, we need to have grants, uh, no interest loans available, but we also have to continue to track businesses and that's an investment in education uh, that drives so much uh, of our ability to do so. Thank you, Mr. McAuliffe. Well, first of all, I want to thank President Biden for the American Recovery Plan. We will get 10 to $14 billion of monies that will come to the Commonwealth of Virginia to help lift everybody up. And I remind you that Glenn Youngkin said that the stimulus was unnecessary. The same stimulus that will create new jobs here in Virginia, the same stimulus that helped us get the vaccination programs up and running. We need to rebuild our economy. We have 182,000 Virginians who've lost their job since COVID started. Listen, I dealt with this before. When I became governor last time, I inherited the largest deficit, created a record 200,000 new jobs, personal income went up 14%, recruited 1,100 new projects and 20 billion of new capital. I was proud. I wrote the bid to bring Amazon to the, the Commonwealth of Virginia, Nestle Corporation. We've got to invest in education. That is the absolute key. We've got to embed computer science skills, STEM H early, K through 12. If we build the best education system, we will build a world-class equitable economy. I did this before during sequestration of the Great Recession. I did it before and I can do it again. And that's why so many people have endorsed my candidacy for governor. Ms. Carter. Well, I tell you what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to give hundreds of millions of dollars of your public money to massive corporations like Amazon and Nestle. When the Amazon HQ2 deal was announced, the rent in my building went up 18% in a month before a single shovel hit the ground, before a single person was hired. It made people's lives worse and we had to pay for the privilege. Nestle was recently hauled before the Supreme Court where they argued that they shouldn't be held liable for child slavery in their supply chain. My administration will not subsidize corporations like that. Uh, we're not gonna be begging billionaires and Wall Street for jobs. We're gonna take that money. We're gonna put it directly into your hands so that you can create your own employee owned businesses. That's more than just a job. That's a business that you own, that you operate, that you are in control of, and that is a pillar of your community. We're gonna do the hard work of building that sector of Virginia's economy that we own, and we're not gonna take shortcuts like begging people like Jeff Bezos to come in here and take our public dollars and pretty please give us some jobs. Ms. Carol Foy, your turn. So I think that the economy is part of the question that needs to be asked is really also how are we going to make Virginia the best place to live, work, and raise a family? How we're we going to help the people who need us the most? And I can tell you that I'm excited and proud to have been a delegate working in General Assembly and with the governor when we were named the number one place to do business, when we put millions of dollars to our rainy day fund, preserved our AAA bond rating, had one of the lowest unemployment rates in recent history. And I've been honored by the Virginia Chamber for my work, but I also have to say I have more union endorsements than any other candidate who's running because the people who are building our roads, bridges, painting our schools, our federal government workers stand with me because they know I will stand with them fighting to ensure we have paid sick days, paid family medical leave, a true $15 minimum wage. We shore up our unemployment insurance here in Virginia, where some people have been backlogged for months. And so it's about doing the good work to not only ensure that we have millions of dollars towards uh, business grants, free money, but also making investments. Please go to my website, jennifercarolfoy.com to read more. Okay. Thank you all. It's been a substantive first half of this candidate forum, education, health care, the economy and the virus. We've gotten through all of that. We're going to do a quick commercial break here and we're going to come back with more, including a question about policing and racial justice.
we are back with the five Democratic candidates for governor here in Virginia. One of the central divides in this race is the experience that some of you are running on versus the new directions that others are calling for or something in between. So I want to ask each of you a version of the same question of simply about why you and not your other opponent should be the next governor. Mr. McAuliffe, I will start with you. In the most recent debate before this one, Jennifer Carroll Foy said you represented the politics of the past. So why are you the best person to be your party's nominee in the future? Listen, I'm here today uh, because people know that I will go big and bold. People know that we now have COVID and the effects of that are going to be around for a long time. But I'm here because the leadership of the Black Caucus of Virginia came to me and said, Terry, no one leaned in more for the black and brown community that you did. More rights restoration than any governor in the history of the United States of America. More pardons than any governor before me here in Virginia. You know, State Senator President Pro Tem Louise Lucas, the most powerful African-American woman in the state, said, we need you to come back. She's now chairing my campaign. But that's why, if you look today, Chuck, that I have three times as many support from the Black Caucus of Virginia as everybody else on this stage combined. Why? I went big and bold under difficult situations before. We need experience now to lead us out of this very tough crisis. I did it before, I'll do it again, and I have big, bold plans, 130 pages, 14 proposals on my website okay. to take Virginia to the next level. We've tinkered around long enough. All right. It is time to lead the country. Thank, thank you. Ms. Thank Carol you. Foy, you have never run for statewide office before, and you've served just a single full term in the House of Delegates. So why should the party take a chance on you to defeat the Republican nominee, Glenn Youngkin? So the Republican Governors Association is attacking me because they are worried and they should be. They know that I am the most electable in this race because I will out inspire and outwork the Republicans in November. I flipped a Republican district while pregnant with twins and being outspent and out endorsed, but I will never be outworked. So many people have told me all my life that it's not my time and not my turn. Millions of women out there know exactly what that feels like, having our experience undermined and our credentials questioned. But I'm not here to ask the patriarchy for permission. I'm here to get things done for the people of Virginia. And I've been one of the most effective legislators in Virginia's history, passing the Equal Rights Amendment, Medicaid expansion, and so much more. So we have an opportunity to build back Virginia in a way that leaves no one behind. And that's what this campaign is about. That's why we're mobilizing. We have the energy. We have the message that's resonating with the people. And I ask for their support for governor on June 8th. Thank you, Ms. McClellan. A new TV ad of yours it argues that Mr. McCullough represents the past, but you chaired his transition to be governor. So how do you square your past support of him versus your opposition now? Governor McAuliffe was the right governor for that time, but Virginia is different. And the good news is we don't have to choose between a new perspective and experience because I bring both. I bring the experience of someone whose parents lived through the tyranny of Jim Crow during the Depression. And I came to the General Assembly as a 32-year-old Black woman from the most Democratic district in the state, operating in a body that was mostly white Republican men over 50. And yet I've been able to pass over 300 bills. And since being in the majority, I'm the only person on this stage who has passed bills to address the clean, uh, clean energy and address climate change, to expand access to reproductive health to expand worker protections to domestic workers, and to create the Voting Rights Act of Virginia, the, one of the strongest Voting Rights Act in the country. And I have the support of the people on the ground who have been doing the work to address inequity and have done more to address inequity than any other candidate on this stage. And bringing perspectives that were not represented in the General Assembly, I will do the same as governor. And that is why the grassroots support of New Virginia Majority and Care in Action is so important, because they know I've been doing the work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McClellan. Mr. Fairfax, you are running on your experience as lieutenant governor. But if voters are looking for experience, executive experience, why choose you over somebody who's already been governor? Well, Chuck, uh, yeah, our current governor, Governor Northam, uh, served as lieutenant governor and then was elected uh, to governor the same uh, for now Senator Tim Kaine. And uh, of course, uh, Governor Doug Wilder uh, first served as lieutenant governor and four years later was elected. Governor, uh, I believe the experience that we've had over the last four years, uh, being part of the most progressive administration in the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, is something that has really resonated with millions of voters around the Commonwealth, 
Uh, I have been proud of the work that I've done to uh, break the ties to expand Medicaid. So now 550,000 more Virginians have health insurance as a result. Uh, breaking the ties to make Virginia the first state in the South to legalize uh, marijuana. Uh, also helping to lead the fight uh, around gun violence prevention, uh, focusing on uh, so many of the issues uh, that go to the heart of whether or not uh, people are safe, uh, secure, and have the opportunity to achieve the American dream. And so we put forward a, an incredible vision uh, that is focused on investments in education, investments in the future, and you pair that with the experience that we've had, the success that we've had over the last four years, and that's uh, a right. vision that I think Virginia supports. Thank you, Mr. Fairfax. And Mr. Carter, Democrats have been trying to defend themselves from Republicans calling them socialists for years now. But you're a proud socialist, Democrat. Why wouldn't that be a liability for the party's next gubernatorial nominee? Because they're going to call you that anyway, Chuck. They call Joe Biden a socialist, and he's about as far right as you can get in the Democratic Party. The Republican Party is not beholden to the truth. And so you just got to lean in. You got to explain the benefits of your policies to the voters. And the question is, who is going to excite voters the most in November? Are people who have been fighting against the Mountain Valley Pipeline and Atlantic Coast Pipeline for the last six or seven years going to be excited to vote for the guy who approved those pipelines? Of course they're not. Are people who are struggling to pay the rent because the Amazon deal jacked up the price of their housing going to be excited to vote for any of the four candidates that supported it? Of course they're not. Are people who care about getting money out of politics going to be excited to vote for a corporate funded candidate? Of course they're not. I'm the only candidate in this Democratic primary who's never taken a single dime from fossil fuel corporations, who's never taken a single dime from big banks, who's never taken a single dime from police organizations. I've never taken any money from any for-profit corporation or industry interest right. group. I never have, and I never will. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Julie Carey has the next question for you guys. In a story that drew national attention last month, police in Windsor, Virginia, pepper sprayed Army Lieutenant Karan Nazario during a traffic stop. The local police department fired the officer who pepper sprayed Nazario, who is black and Latino, but it refused to apologize to him. As governor, what would you do to make sure police departments across the Commonwealth are treating all Virginians equally? And what more needs to be done to hold law enforcement accountable? Mr. Fairfax, if you'll please answer first. This is a critical issue, and we have made progress in Virginia in our most recent sessions around criminal justice reform and policing reform, banning no-knock warrants, banning chokeholds, uh, making it easier to decertify officers that engage in police misconduct. Uh, but as uh, that uh, it, Windsor um, incident uh, highlights and, and, and so many incidents around Virginia and around our nation, uh, there is still so much more work to be done. Uh, we need to have a diversified police force. Uh, we need to have retraining and bias training so that uh, so much of what we've seen around racial uh, bias, where uh, drivers and, and others who encounter police uh, are treated very differently based on the color of their skin, uh, and what neighborhood they may be in, uh, has to stop. Uh, and so uh, we need to make those investments, but also uh, ensure that there's accountability. Uh, we need universal uh, body cameras throughout Virginia. Uh, we also have to make sure uh, that when an officer is brought up on misconduct charges, that it's transparent. Uh, and then we have civilian review boards with subpoena power. So there's accountability in the community. Mr. McAuliffe, you're next. Yeah, you know, Julie, you saw that video. You were just plain horrified. You had a son who was a captain in the United States Marine Corps, and he was stationed down in the Hampton Roads region by Windsor. I can promise you what Lieutenant Nazario went through, my son, who is white, would never be stopped if he was wearing the flag and cloth of our country. That would not have happened to him. And we can't tolerate it. We need zero tolerance for this. So as governor, I will make sure that we need full accountability. We need full transparency with our law enforcement. We need body cameras. Everybody should have body cameras. And they also should be turned on. Uh, so if they're on duty, those uh, cameras have to be turned on. And that's what we need to do going forward. Uh, it is just absolutely critical to build an equitable. You know, an equitable criminal justice system is something I fought for as governor. As I mentioned before, I had more pardons than any governor before me. I restored more felon rights than any governor in U.S. history. The Republicans sued me and sued me for contempt of court. I will always lean in to make sure we have a fair, equitable criminal justice system. It is key to the success of our commonwealth. Thank you, Mr. Carter. 
The United States incarcerates more of its people than any other country in history, in history. And the overwhelming majority of those people are locked up by state courts, not federal. But every one of those incarcerations begins with an encounter with a police officer. And so we have to address the problem where it begins, in police funding. Now, when Terry McAuliffe was governor, he increased police funding twice as fast as the Republican governor before him. But I have actually fought to decrease police funding because I think we're asking police to do too much. I don't think it makes sense to have an armed policeman doing mental health checks or welfare checks or traffic enforcement. I think that we need to go line by line on all of the things that we're asking police to do and ask ourselves, does it make sense to have an armed policeman do this job? Or would we all be safer, including the police officers, if we had an unarmed non-police agency handling this task? I think we need to start from scratch and we need to reimagine what public safety looks like that doesn't begin with a police officer pointing a gun at someone. Thank you, Ms. Carol Foy. So as the first public defender ever elected to the Virginia General Assembly, I've been fighting this issue from the courthouse to the state house. Every day I walk into that courtroom and I am protecting my clients, people who are majority black, brown, poor Virginians. Um, and I can tell you that oftentimes the cameras aren't on when I have a client come to me who's been beaten and bruised while in police custody. But it is my job to hold everyone's feet to the fire and ensure I protect people's constitutional rights. And so I say, don't listen to the rhetoric, check the record. And I have a record of carrying a bill as a legislator to prohibit the use of chokeholds by law enforcement officers so we don't have an Eric Garner situation here in Virginia. Helping to pass a bill to have a ban on no-knock warrants so we don't have a Breonna Taylor situation here in Virginia. But if we do, helping to pass bills as a legislator to have civilian review boards, but as governor, I'll go bigger and bolder and I will have mandated civilian re re review boards with subpoena power throughout Virginia and in qualified immunity. And Ms. McClellan. This is not a new issue. And I have had to answer questions from my son that I hoped I'd never have to answer about whether he could be the victim of gun violence uh, or police violence in particular, as he's seen children not much older than him uh, killed by police officers. The record will show that I have been working on this issue in criminal justice reform uh, in, uh, comprehensively before the cameras were on, before it was hot topic for the press. And we need to build on that progress. I helped to write the bills that passed during the special session addressing uh, comprehensive police reform, including the Marcus Alert, but we need to make it stronger. We need to make sure that when someone is in a mental health crisis and a mental health professional is on the scene, that police officers that may be on the scene are not in marked cars or in uniform because that in and of itself can be triggering. We have to end qualified immunity because when a police officer violates someone's civil rights and it ends in death or injury, they need to be held accountable. We need to have more than just civilian review boards with subpoena power. We need to have independent investigative units at the attorney general's office and for our state law enforcement. Before uh, Jumi asks the next question, I want to give the candidates a reminder. We're going to go down to 30 second answers now in order to get a couple more questions in. Jumi Olobanji with the next question. Thank you so much. Uh, we know that President Joe Biden has proposed raising taxes on the wealthy, uh, not only for millionaires, but for Virginians who make more than $400,000. Do you support higher taxes for this group of Virginians, those with incomes less than a million, but more than $400,000 a year? We will begin with Mr. Carter. Absolutely. Uh, our income tax here in Virginia has its highest bracket starting at just $17,000, which means if you work 40 hours a week at minimum wage, you are paying in the highest tax bracket. I think that's absurd. There's no other country on earth that can call itself progressive that has a tax system uh, that leans so heavily on the poor as ours does, and that has got to change. Ms. Carol Foy, you're next. So... Yes, I do. And I can say that while wages have not significantly grown, the wealth gap has. We need to reward work and not just wealth. And as governor, I will find wasteful spending, ineffective tax breaks, and closed corporate loopholes. And I have a plan on my website at jennifercarolfoy.com, the only gubernatorial candidate to raise $8 billion in new revenue in the next 10 years. Please go to jennifercarolfoy.com. Ms. McClellan, you're next. 
I support comprehensive tax reform that makes Virginia's tax code more fair, more progressive, and less regressive, which is why, as a member of the Senate Finance Committee, I was proud to support and get in our state budget that comprehensive review that's happening right now and will make recommendations before the next governor is, is elected, in which I will make sure that we implement tax reform that shifts the tax burden so that it's not disproportionately falling on people who can't afford to pay. It is not disproportionately falling on our local governments to fill gaps that the state is not. Mr. Fairfax, your answer. Yes, I support uh, President Biden's initiative uh, to reform our tax system to ensure that not only is it more equitable, but that we're able to make the investments uh, that we need to make to deal with this COVID-19 pandemic, but also the inequalities that we uh, have seen uh, in our education system, our healthcare system, and, and housing to ensure there's more affordable housing and housing security. Uh, and so uh, these uh, are tied to investment that are critical. And as we've seen with the support that's come in from the federal government over the course of the last year, it is essential uh, to have the resources to be able to together deal with these issues so that everyone can be supported. And Mr. McAuliffe, we'll go to you. Sure, the president's raising money to fund infrastructure, which is sorely needed. We need it here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I think the work, I remind everybody, when I became governor of the Port of Virginia was in financial disarray. It's now one of the most profitable ports in the East Coast. Dulles Airport was in trouble. I worked with United to save 45,000 jobs up at Dulles International Airport. So we want a fair tax code, but let's be honest, Glenn Youngkin is a private equity billionaire who supported the Trump tax cuts, supported the Trump tax right. cuts where 80% went to the top 1%. That Thank is the challenge that Virginia is going to face Thank in the you. general election. Thank you, Mr. McCullough. Uh, final question here. Republicans uh, pick their nominee for governor through a convention. And this means that there could be thousands of Republican voters voting in this contest. Since Virginia is an open primary state, and since this is the only primary they can participate in. So, what is your message to these Virginia Republicans who might be considering casting a ballot in the Democratic primary on June 8th? Ms. McClellan, 30 seconds. Well, I'm hoping that you're voting in the primary because you want a governor that is going to solve our problems. And we are at a critical crossroads as a commonwealth where we need to rebuild our economy, our health care, our economic safety nets, our education system in a way that leaves no Virginian and no Virginia community behind. And I have proven, working 14 years in the minority party, that I can stand up for progressive values and addressing inequity while working across the aisle and finding common ground, because we have more in common than divides us. And it is time for a governor candidate who focuses on what we can do together and not just on dividing us. Thank you, Ms. McClellan. Mr. Fairfax. Uh, I was proud, uh, Chuck, when I was elected to lieutenant governor in 2017 to have received the most votes in the history of Virginia, 1.36 million votes for lieutenant governor. And that included uh, many people who uh, also uh, may identify as Republican or independents. Uh, but that's because we had a message uh, like we have now that focused on lifting up all eight and a half million Virginians. Uh, and so as we provided health care to five, uh, 150,000 more Virginians, those aren't all Democrats. As we are doing transportation investments in education, uh, those apply across the board to all of our children. And so uh, it's a universal message about lifting everyone up, and we want everyone's support. Thank you, Mr. Fairfax. Mr. McAuliffe, uh, your case to Republican voters. We're going to face a tough economy. COVID has been devastating to so many Virginia families. As governor before, through the Great Recession, sequestration, I inherited the largest debt, left a gigantic surplus, record 200,000 new jobs, billion-dollar record investment in education. I'll work in, on the economy. I worked in a bipartisan way with Republicans. As governor, I got over 70 percent of my governor's bills passed with an extreme right-wing legislature. I kept our 16 women's health clinics open. I stopped all the anti-social legislation that came to my desk. I built an open and welcoming state with a dynamite right. economy, and I'm going to do it again. Thank you. Mr. Carter, uh, your appeal to potential Republican voters. Well, to any potential Republican voters out there, I'd say you don't have to agree with me to know that I'm telling it to you true. Uh, I'm the only candidate in this Democratic primary who's never taken any money from for-profit corporations or industry interest groups. So I'm working for the people of Virginia and only for the people of Virginia. And you know that I don't just toe the party line. I criticize my own party just as much as I criticize the Republicans. 
I'm proud to have the least partisan voting record in the House of Delegates through my time there, not because I vote with the other party, but because I vote against both parties when I feel they're both in the wrong. So right. um, I am honest with you, and I am only working Thank for you. you. Uh, and Ms. Carol Foy, your uh, message to potential Republican primary voters. As one of the first women to ever graduate from Virginia Military Institute, it taught me to not care if people have a D, I, or R beside their name. My job is to get the job done. And that's what I've done being one of the most effective legislators in Virginia's history. And so I can tell you that voters are tired of voting for wealthy, out of touch politicians, failing to stand with victims of police violence or fighting for women's equality. And that's why we need a new leader with a clear vision and bold ideas and a record of getting things done for the people of Virginia. Please join me and vote Jennifer Carroll for on June right. 8th. Well, you guys all made it under the time cues. I appreciate that. I uh, this concludes this candidate's forum. Thank you to the Democratic Party of Virginia, NBC4, and Telemundo 44 for making all of this forum possible. And thanks to the candidates for their participation. By the way, don't forget to vote. The primary is on June 8th. Thanks for tuning in. And for all our panelists, this is Chuck Todd in Washington. Good day.